All right. Um, in our study so far, we, we are in the middle of the tribulation period. And I told you that from Revelation chapter 10 through Revelation chapter 16, the Lord is going to show us things that happened before in the first half of the tribulation period. And we are going to see some things that are going to happen in the second half of the tribulation period. So he is prepping us to understand what is taking place around the middle of the tribulation period. You remember we talked about the first half of the tribulation period was very simple and straightforward. We had Revelation chapter 6 dealt with the six seals. And then the six seals ended with a question. The great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And then Revelation chapter 7 showed us two groups of people who will be successful in the tribulation period. We saw the 144,000 Jews and we saw the tribulation saints uh, or the saved of the tribulation. And we said in order for these people to be saved, they will be killed. They will be martyrs for Jesus. And then um, that's Revelation 7, Revelation chapter 8. We started with the trumpets and the, se the seven angels, they, they were preparing to sound their trumpets. And that scene was interrupted by uh, an uh, offering on the golden altar. The angel came and offered prayers and incense uh, on the golden altar, which is before the throne of God. And then the seven angels with their trumpets began to sound. And the first four trumpets sounded. And then the, the, the session ended with an angel flying through the skies saying, whoa, whoa, whoa to the, to the inhabitants of the earth because of the three more trumpets to be sounded. Then um, we saw the, the fifth trumpet, which was the locust. And then we saw the, the sixth trumpet. And then we saw the angel. This is Revelation chapter 10. We saw the angel with uh, standing on the earth and standing in the ocean. And um, he had a book open in his hands. And then we saw John going up to that angel, taking the book and so on and so on. And then we went to chapter 10 last week. Um, chapter 10, that was chapter 10. And then chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, we spend all evening on verses 1 and 2, where John said, I, I, um, I was given a reed like unto a rod, and uh, the angels stood and say, rise, measure the temple and the altar, and they that worship therein. But don't measure the, the outer court, don't measure the, uh, the courts of the Gentiles because that is given unto the, the Gentiles. And we spend all evening on that, and we talk about the, the um, temple being rebuilt. We talk about the Temple Mount, and that's where we ended. Now, before I go into today's lesson, which is the two witnesses, uh, we had a conversation with Brother Larry last week, I did, and he mentioned something. He said that, uh, hold on, let me get my slides. All right. He asked a question. He said, when I said time and times and dividing of time, that is two and a half years. And I, uh, when you, I am going to talk about this now, just in case there is anybody else who saw it that way. So Larry is not uh, um, putting you down, but lifting you up because other people might want to have that same question. Now look at this verse, Daniel chapter seven, verse 25. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, what is going on here is, let me, let me get my pen.
All right. When we talk about a time, that is one year, uh, and that is singular. And when we talk about times, that is two years. So you have one plus two, that is three years. And dividing of time is half a year. So this is three and a half years. This is how we got three and a half years. Now, I have another verse. And swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time and times and then half. And when he shall have accomplished to shatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Here again, we see a time, that is one year, times, that is two years. So this is three years here. Half a time is six months. So three and a half years. And then I have another one. Where she is nourished for a time, and times and half a time. Again, three and a half years. Okay, so just in case anybody else thought is this is two and a half years. No, it is three and a half years. The first one, a time is one year, times is plural, that is two years. So one plus two plus half is three. But I, I was glad that Larry talked about this because I want to show you something else about this. And when they, and they shall be given into his hands. They is Israel. His hands is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Look at this one. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, uh, that it shall be for a time, times and half a time, when he is the Antichrist and the holy people, is Israel. Now, every time God is talking about the Antichrist in connection with Israel, he is using this term to measure time. In this three occasions, and she, this word here, she is Israel. From the face of the serpent, that is the Antichrist. Again, Israel and the Antichrist, whenever God have these two together and they have a, a, a period of time where there will be judgment and it comes from the Antichrist to Israel, he used this term of measurement, a time and times and dividing of time. Now, in our lessons today, you are going to see three different ways that God measure time when it comes to the tribulation period. So Larry, that was a good question and I appreciate that. Let's go on. Now, Lachelle mentioned this. She said she liked, she was happy with this slide because she knew nothing about the outer court. And we said this here is uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness. This is as original as you will get. This is what Moses saw in heaven. And the first temple, the second temple, <clears throat> the third temple, they all will have this same pattern. They will have the Holy of Holies, which is here. They will have the Holy Place, which is here. And they will have the outer court, which is here. All the temples, regardless of which one, it will be in this design. This is the design of the temple in heaven. She liked that. She, she, she was happy to, to see that. And again, this is another picture of the temple and the outer court, which is the court of the Gentiles. You have this area here and this area here of the temple in Jerusalem or when it existed in Jerusalem. And that is the outer court. It is, it is said that this is where the money changers were. This is where the people selling uh, 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 sheep and stuff like that so that you can sacrifice in the temple. Jesus turned over their tables twice. They said it was the outer court. So this is just by the way. And I was happy for the questions. 
all the comments, and this is what is the result. Now let's go on. Uh, another thing Lachelle said that she liked very much was she was amazed at how many sacrifices the Jewish people did in one day. A bullock before the Lord by the door of the temple, that was one, and they had to slay a ram and sprinkle the blood on the altar, that is two, and they had to kill two lambs, one in the morning, one in the evening. This is what we call the daily sacrifice in the temple. All yeah. these things will be reinstated down the road. Now, this is just, again, scratching the surface because in uh, the Feast of Sukkot, the Jewish people will kill 70 bulls in seven days, seven zero bulls in seven days, and 140 lambs within that same period of time. And on the Sabbaths, they will double up these sacrifices in the morning and in the evening. And all special events, they will double up the sacrifices. So this is just part of the daily sacrifices that will be reinstated in the temple. So that was some questions I had and some comments I had last week. So I just want to, to, to get this out anyway. Now let's go on. Today's lesson. And I will give power, this is Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days in sackcloth. So I will give power unto my two witnesses. There are two witnesses. The period of their ministry is 1,260 days. They will be dressed in sackcloth. The reason why I'm stressing sackcloth is as I listen to other Bible teachers teach Revelation chapter 11, they said that this is two Christian preachers. They say the two witnesses are two Christian preachers. I am saying no. And the reason why I am saying no is these two witnesses will be dressed in sackcloth. Have you ever seen Creflo Dollar on television? How he dressed? Have you ever seen uh, Jesse Duplantis? How he dressed? Have you ever seen um, uh, Joel Osteen? How he dressed? They dress perfectly. Perfectly. Do you see any of them shedding their suits and putting on sackcloth? I don't think so. All right, so that's the easiest one. So we get rid of that. Let's go on. This is what the material that they use for sackcloth. It is bag. Uh -huh. It could be a rice bag, could be a potato bag, could be, it's a bag. This is what a sackcloth would look like. This is a pretty one. Uh -huh. All right, this is a pretty one. You see they have some piping on the neck and on the sleeves. All right, this is a pretty one. This is what a sackcloth would look like. You cut three holes, one for the neck and two for the arms, and you put that on and you take a piece of rope and you tie the waist. Mm -hmm. That is sackcloth. That is what these two witnesses will be wearing for 1260 days. Let's go on. I will give power onto my two witnesses. Now, this is something, this is a pattern when it comes to ministry and when it comes to, to the Lord. He do not send you out to witness unless he give you power. He do not send you in ministry unless he give you power for that ministry. Now, we had some witnesses before. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judah, and in all Judah, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You will receive power first, and then you shall be witnesses unto me. When you see who these two witnesses are, you will ask the question, did they really need extra power? But God, when he sent you to witness, when he put you on a mission field, he gives you the power to go with the ministry. Always, always, always. This 
Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 went out to Peter, James, John, and the other disciples. And we also adopt this. So when you go out witnessing, when you go out preaching, when you go out on a mission, you receive that power first, and then you go out. Let's go on. He said, I will give power unto my two witnesses. A witness is one who declares the truth concerning matters or facts. One who can testify of the truth of what he had seen and heard and know. That is what a witness is. Someone who, who will testify to the truth of what he has seen, heard, and what he knows. That is what a witness does. I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now the next question is, why did Jesus have two witnesses? Why not three? Why not six? Why not one? Why did Jesus need two witnesses? Look at this, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy to of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The law requires that you, that you have two witnesses. The Old Testament law said you must have two witnesses. Guess what? In the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, Jesus still kept the law. He still kept the law. Look at the other verse. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin or in any sin that he had committed. One witness don't work. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. I, I keep putting this forward to let you know that the law required in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, two witnesses. It is also written in your law, Jesus said, that the testimony of two men are true. That is John chapter 8, verse 17. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus was Torah. Jesus was the word. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word said, you must have two witnesses. That's why Jesus have two witnesses. And if he shall not hear thee, then take with, with thee one or two more. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So why did Jesus have two witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11? Because the law requires that you have two witnesses. Jesus came to fulfill the Torah. He came to fulfill the law. Now, what did these men witness? What did they see? In these faded pictures, you see two guys here. And you see two guys here. This is the resurrection. And this is the ascension. Let me get, let me get rid of this. And it came to pass as, uh, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? And when the disciples went to the grave to look for Jesus, there were two men standing there in shining garments. These two witnesses were those same two men who witnessed Jesus coming back in his body after he went down to hell. After Jesus went down to Hades, he spent his time there preaching to the, to the angels, the fallen angels, setting the captives free. And on the third day, he came back into his body. These two men saw when Jesus came back into his body. Nobody else on earth ever saw that but these two men. Then look at this verse. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men. That would be the same two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This Again, the same two men saw Jesus who was resurrected, 
now being ascended to his father's throne. So a, a witness is someone who will testify to what they have seen, what they have heard, and what they know. This is what these men know. Now, this is a faded picture of two olive trees and two candlesticks. And they are, these are the two olive trees and Jesus is talking about the two witnesses, Revelation chapter 11, verse four. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Collectively, when God talked about his two witnesses, he said these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. This is not original. This exact statement was made in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 11. Then said I, then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof. So this vision of the two olive trees and the two candlesticks was first seen in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah chapter four. Now we're not gonna get into the whole story, but this was the time when Zerubbabel and Joshua was building the temple of God. Okay, and Joshua and Zerubbabel was pronounced to be the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God or standing before the God of the earth. And this is what, this is, uh, all right, give me a second. Then, then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. Is the exact thing that, uh, that Jesus said in the book of Revelation, that Zechariah said in Zechariah chapter 4, verse uh, 14. Now, the story about the two olive trees and the two candlesticks, they said there were golden pipes from the olive trees that go straight into the candlesticks, feeding the candlesticks constantly oil so they will remain bright. And then the verse came, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The whole picture is, is telling us that the anointing, the Holy Spirit, constantly flowing through the golden pipes into the candlesticks. These two witnesses will have a constant flowing of the Holy Spirit in their life during their, their service. And this, I believe, can be applied to us also. It was applied to Zerubbabel and Joshua. It was applied to Jesus' two witnesses in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 4. Now, Revelation, chapter 11, verse 5. If any man will hurt them, fire proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So these two witnesses, they had somewhat supernatural power, but they had the anointing constantly flowing through them, constantly flowing. And if anybody tried to hurt them, fire will proceed out of their mouth and will kill those people. How many of us would like to have that kind of power today? How many of us would like to have that power when our neighbor is cursing at us? or somebody bad drive us on the road, or somebody do us wrong. These, these two witnesses, they had the power to kill. Now, the question is, why would they need this power? They will need this power because during that period in time, they would be targets. During that period in time, they will be constantly under death threat. That is why um, this, the Lord said this about them. Now, the question is, would there actually be fire coming out of their mouths and devouring their enemies? Or what else? Let's see what, what the scriptures say. Therefore, have I hewn them by the prophet. I have slain them 
by the words of my mouth and thy judgment are as the light that goeth forth. So what this verse is saying is that the words of their mouth is what kill the people. Now let's see the other verse. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because he speak this word, behold, I will make my word in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. So the question remains, would the people be killed by these two prophets just speaking the word, or will fire actually come out of their mouth? I don't know. Let's go on. Now, he is separating them. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the day of their prophecy. So one of them had power to shut heaven. And have power over water to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So one of them had power to shut heaven. And the other one had power to turn water to blood and, and, and smite the earth with plagues as often as they will. So by now you have an idea who, do, you know, who these two people are. One is Elijah. And Elijah the Tidbite, as a as the Lord God, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years but according to my word. This is Joshua, uh, uh, Elizabeth talking, uh, sorry, Elijah talking to Ahab. And he said, um, there will be no rain. There will be no dew according to my words. These have power to shut the heaven that it rained not. And it came to pass after many days that the Lord that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. So it did not rain for three years, saying, go show thyself to Ahab. Remember I told you it's Ahab and Elijah. And Elijah said, it will not rain. You will not get any dew. And now we know it's the period of time is three years. And God is saying, show yourself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So God is promising um, Elijah, he's going to send rain. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Elijah showed himself to Ahab, and he told Ahab, there is an abundance of rain. I heard the sound of rain. The, the rain is coming. So it, the first person who had the power to shut heaven and that it rained not is Elijah. Now, I like, I like this. I, I, I just put this in. This has nothing to do with nothing, but I just put this in. Second Kings chapter 1, verse 10. And Elijah answered and said, on, said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Mm -hmm. What happened here was Ahab sent the captain with 50 men to bring Elijah to his palace. And I think they approached Elijah, they approached Elijah in the wrong way. Hey, Elijah, come on, let's go. Ahab want to see you. And the man got angry with them. This is how I see it. And Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and consume the 50 that is with you. Don't take that guy off. And they did it again. Second Kings chapter 1 verse, uh, verse 12. And Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And fire came down from heaven uh, and consumed him and his fifty. So Ahab sent another fifty men, uh, fifty men with a captain. And again, they take, they take Elijah off. 
They talked to him the wrong way. Elijah didn't like it. And he said, listen, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. And fire came down and consumed them. So Ahab sent another 50. That's 150. And they learned. They said, Mr. Mr. Elijah, sir, could you please go with us to King Ahab? And he spared them. So Elijah was one of these guys who had that kind of authority and that kind of power. One of the weaknesses we believe is Elijah. Now look at this one. And have power over water to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they wish, as they will. This is the 10 plagues that was laid on the earth in Egypt by Moses. So the second weakness will be Moses. Now, some people say it, it could have been uh, uh, enough. We don't know enough about it enough to say yes, but this, this is evidence enough for us that the two, the two weaknesses, one Moses and one Elijah. Now, let's go on. The last book in the Old Testament. Uh, this is Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. What the Lord is saying. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with statutes and judgment. The last book in the Old Testament, God said, remember the law of Moses. And verse 5, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the other person, the other witness is Elijah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Least I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the last, the very last book in the Old Testament, God reminds us to remember the law of Moses and to remember the, uh, remember the prophet Elijah. And he will send the prophet Elijah. Another reason why we say the prophet Elijah is this is the transfiguration of Jesus. Behold, there appear unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Again, and there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And again, behold, they talk with him two men, which, is, which were Moses and Elijah. So at the transfiguration, again, it was Moses and Elijah. I think I gave you overwhelming um, facts that, that the two men are Moses and Elijah. Now look at this last word. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish in Jerusalem. The two men, Moses and Elijah, they were discussing or they were making plans for the crucifixion of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. That is what they were doing. So it was Moses and Elijah. So the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 uh, is Moses and Elijah. Now, I want to show you the different terms God used to measure time in the book of Revelation. For it is given unto the Gentiles that the holy city shall be, shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. That is Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. And look at the other one. My two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,200 and three score days. Now, both is two and a half and three and a half years, but the days are different. Now, the first one here in gray is time of the Gentiles. Gentiles time, the month have 30 days, 31 days. 28 days and 29 in the leap year. So although it's three and a half years, it is 1,278 days. And when the Lord is talking about his people, Israel, or his two witnesses, which is the two prophets, it is 1,260 days or three and a half years. But it's always three and a half years. That will make it seven years. So, so far today, now, 
this part here where the, the outer court was given unto the Gentiles and they will tread it underfoot for 40 and two months is during the great tribulation. That is the second half of the tribulation period. And that is Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. The two witnesses, which is Moses and Elijah, they will be prophesying for 1,203 score days, which is 1,260 days. This is in the first half of the tribulation period. Now, we, we in, in our day, we, we were taught that the two witnesses will be in the last half of the tribulation period. No, that is not going to be. The two witnesses will be in the first part of the tribulation period. So let's fix this. Now this is how it will be. The two witnesses will be in the first part of the tribulation period. It is called a tribulation period. And uh, the Gentiles will have Jerusalem for 40 and two months, which will be the great tribulation. Now we're gonna go deeper into this. So just in case you have any questions, don't worry about it. We, we will take care of that. And then earlier today, I showed you time and times and dividing of time. So this is the three uh, uh, different methods or terms that God used to measure three and a half years. Okay, he said, uh, time, times, and half a time, that is three and a half years. Uh, the time of the Gentiles will be 1,278 days. And the two witnesses will be witnessing for two, 1,260 days. All that is three and a half years. Let's go on. Now, in this picture, you see two guys dead. And when they have finished, and when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, I, I personally, I live my life by this verse. And when they shall finish their testimony, when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. Now, we did not see, now I, I suppose to tell you this from the very beginning, John did not see these two witnesses. John was told about these two witnesses. He was told by Jesus about these two witnesses. He did not see them, okay? I, I should have made that clear from the very beginning. Now, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. We did not see when this beast from the bottomless pit came up. We didn't see that. What we saw, we saw the bottomless pit was opened by an angel that had fallen. That is in Revelation chapter 9. And John said, and I saw an angel fall from heaven. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And when he opened the bottomless pit, there came a great um, smoke like a furnace and out of the smoke came four locusts. That is what we saw in Revelation chapter 9. We did not see when this beast came out but the Lord is saying this creature came out of the bottomless pit also. And only when they had finished their testimony then and only then they were killed. The only time they, 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 they were killed was when they were finished their testimony. Now, people tried to kill them throughout the, trip, the, the first half of the tribulation period. That is why he gave them a, a, a power that, 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 that their words out of their mouth or fire would actually come out of their mouth and kill their enemies. They were constantly under threat. The question is, who was threatening them? Now, the reason why these two men are in the first part of the tribulation period is because they were prophesying in Jerusalem and they were prophesying in the temple in Jerusalem. And what was happening in the temple in Jerusalem at that time? 
their daily sacrifices was reinstated. <coughs> now that is a big deal. That is a big deal. You will not hear any Bible teachers telling you this, but when the temple is rebuilt and the daily sacrifices are reinstated and the scripture demands that the temple be rebuilt. Remember, um, Jesus said that he will put an end. The prophecy said that he will put an end to the daily sacrifices. The only way he can do that is if the temple is rebuilt. And also, when you hear about the abomination that causes desolation, for that to happen, the temple has to be rebuilt. Because I told you, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and sit in the temple and declare himself to be God. Now, the re-establishment of the daily sacrifices is a second rejection of Jesus Christ. The Jews did not believe in Jesus Christ. They did not accept him. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. All right. And when they, uh, now you got to understand that when Jesus died, the Jews continued their sacrifices. And let's say Jesus died in, 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 in 30 AD. For, for 40 years, they continued their sacrifices, the sacrifices of the lamb and the bull and the goat and the, the pigeons and stuff like that. They continued those sacrifices because they did not accept the sacrifice that was made by Jesus Christ. And the temple had to be destroyed because they would still be doing those sacrifices today. So the temple had to be destroyed. Now, during that 40 years, it is said that certain stuff happened in the temple that was weird. For example, Azazel or the two goats, remember they had two goats and they would cast lots and one of the goats will go into the wilderness and they will take a, a red ribbon from the head of the goat and tie it to the, to the door, the doorpost in the temple. That was a red ribbon. And when they, they, when they took that goat and they, took, they take it to the wilderness and that goat dies, the ribbon on the door of the temple will turn white. After Jesus died on the cross, that ribbon never turned white for 40 years. The temple door that was closed at night will be opened by itself. Nobody is opening it. It takes 24 men to open that door. The door will open by itself. The, the, um, the menorah, the menorah in the temple, the three, the, there were seven candles on that menorah. The, the four in the middle would be out at, at during the day and two on the eastern side and one on the western side will remain lit. After Jesus died on the cross, that, those lights were out completely. And they said the light is, is a representation of Jesus or of God's presence in the temple. After Jesus died, that light was no longer on. Now, when the Jews reinstate the, the, uh, the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices, for the second time, they are rejecting Jesus and his sacrifice. Now, what these two witnesses will be doing is while the priest is, is making his sacrifice on the altar, they would explain to him that this is why Jesus came. The blood of sheep and goat does not wash away your sins. The blood of, of, of bulls does not wash away your sins. It just covers your sins. But Jesus Christ died so that, so that his blood can wash away your sins. And they will be preaching to the priest. Now you got to understand, for 2,000 years, the Jewish people longed for their temple in Jerusalem. They longed to offer their sacrifices to Yahweh in Jerusalem. Now they get a chance to, to offer their sacrifices. These two prophets are telling them, no, you are wrong. Jesus died for you. Jesus' blood can wash away your sins. And they would want to kill these men. But they cannot kill them because fire will proceed out of their mouth. Whether it's through their words of the natural fire and it will devour their enemies. 
So throughout the tribulation period, the first three and a half years, the sacrifices will be reinstated. And these two witnesses will be witnessing in Jerusalem about Jesus Christ and what he did and his resurrection and his crucifixion. That is what the argument will be about during the tribulation period. That is why they will be, uh, the, the people who want to kill them. Now the Antichrist, he will not be able to make a move on the temple while these two men are alive. He will not be able to make a move on the temple. But when their ministry is over, and I believe for every Christian under the sound of my voice, when the time that, that you go home to meet the Lord is when your ministry is over. That's my personal belief. I believe that. When your ministry is finished, and Paul, Paul said that, he said, I have finished the course. I have run the race. Now is laid up for me in treasures in heaven. It was time for him to go because he had finished the race. So these men, they will, uh, when their ministry is over, when their testimony is over, then and only then with the beast that came out of the bottomless pit will kill them. Let's go on. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So there's no question. Their bodies will be on the streets, lying on the streets. They will not allow them to be buried. They will be lying on the streets in Jerusalem. Now, it bugs me when people try to figure out what city is this. Where was our Lord crucified? Outside of Jerusalem. All right. Which is the great city? Jerusalem. And it is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt because of the sins that was committed in the city. It's spiritually called that. All right. So their dead bodies will lie on the streets of the great city. And they of the people and kindred and tongue and nation shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer them, their dead bodies to be put in graves. Uh, let's say 200 years ago, people trying to explain Revelation couldn't figure out how the world will see the dead bodies. Today we know via satellite, via Skype, via Zoom, whatever you got. Uh, now you can talk to people from all over the world. This is so possible. Now the reason why um, you know that this is the time of the Gentiles, this is when the Gentiles is controlling Jerusalem because the Jewish people buried the dead the same day that they died. Jesus died at three o'clock. By sunset, he was already in the grave. All right. These men were not allowed to be buried for three and a half days. They were not allowed to be put into, into the graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Now, their ministry, a lot of people would wish they had a ministry like this. They were stationed in Jerusalem, but their ministry was spread throughout the world. They didn't take an airplane and go from country to country witnessing for Jesus. They didn't do that. Their ministry was in Jerusalem for three and a half years in the temple in Jerusalem. They were, they were witnesses for Jesus to the Jewish people. This is the time when Jesus is turning his attention to Israel. This is the time when he is getting ready to redeem his people, Israel. This is the beginning of the redemption. Now, this is, this is how we can see God's love. He took three and a half years and bring back his two witnesses. Who is better to talk about the law than Moses? Who is better to talk about the prophets than Elijah? This is why God brought back these two men for Israel so that he will start redeeming Israel. But instead of redeeming Israel, they were killed. Let's go on. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them that saw them. So they will be resurrected or they will be raised from the dead after three and a half days. And 
they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Now, some people use this verse, come up here to here, to say that the rapture will take place mid-trip. All right, this here is not a rapture. This here is an ascension. Look what happened. And they, they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. When the rapture is taking place, it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Their enemies saw them slowly go up to heaven in a cloud. That is an ascension. Let's go on. Now, now look at this Acts chapter 1 verse 9 through 11a. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? And then look at the, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 12. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. It's the same procedure. This is an ascension, not the rapture. The rapture would happen in the twinkling of an eye. We would just disappear. Let's go on. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnants were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, this is important. The remnants. Remember where they were killed? They were killed in Jerusalem. The Jewish people were still in Jerusalem at that time when these two men were killed. The, the, the remnants is, is, is the Jewish people, and they were frightened, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. They gave glory to the God of heaven. This is important. This is the point where they, their eyes were beginning to open when the Jewish people were beginning to believe that they had a problem. They were beginning to believe that these two men who came as witnesses were important when they saw them raised from the dead and slowly went up to heaven in the clouds. Then they saw an earthquake. Doesn't that remind you of Jesus and how at his... Uh, at, at his uh, 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 death, there was an earthquake. They saw him go up to heaven. And there was some similarity there. And these Jewish people, they were beginning to realize that these guys could be the, telling the truth. Something here is, 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 is out of whack. Okay, we have to be wrong. So their eyes were beginning to open at this point in time. It is not yet open, but it is beginning to open. Now, this is the end. Uh, this is Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So this is the first woe ended in, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 12. The second woe started in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13, and ended in Revelation chapter 11, Verse 14. The third woe starts in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. So I would stop here for today. This is a lot of information. A lot, a lot of information. And I would like you to read over Revelation chapter 11. And if you see any questions, anything you want me to go over, anything you want me to explain, anything you have any questions about, and we will answer it before we start the lesson next week. So read Revelation chapter 11, read Revelation chapter 12, and we will stop here for tonight. Uh, before, before I do that, uh, let me see if, 
just give me a second. Let me see if I could find it. All right, one second. All right. Now, I, 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 I heard a lot of statements about the war in Ukraine. I heard a lot of statements on work, at home, all over the place. So I want to share two scriptures with you in closing. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdoms. And there shall be famine, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. You know, I've, I've heard some people, you know, like, like the the. the they're confused, they're worried. This is just the beginning. But this is what you have to do. This is the important part. John chapter, I don't think it's one. I think it's 14. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give, it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So just in case you have anxiety about what is happening in the world, these two verses or two sets of verses should be comforting to you. All right. Yes, the end is not yet. Yes, these things are the beginning of sorrow. But Jesus said, my peace, I give one to you. So what you do is you receive the peace of Jesus in your heart and he will calm you down. Okay, I'll turn over to Pastor Michael. 